Live from New York, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Spark Summit East, brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Jeff Frick and George Gilbert. Jeff, the last time we had it. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You are watching The Cube live from Midtown Manhattan at Spark Summit East. We're excited to be here. Spark is the latest, greatest, coolest thing in data science and big data, so we had to come out, get the smartest people we could find, extract the signal from the noise, get their insight, and share it with you, our audience. So we're really excited to be joined by Peter Lee, who we just saw, it seems like, only yesterday yeah, in only Manhattan. Yesterday. CEO of Rapid Miner. Uh, we were at your event, uh, Rapid Miner Wisdom. Welcome back. Great, great to see you again, Jeff. Absolutely, so uh, before we jump in, give us a quick update, I don't know, uh, if you had some good updates in the last, only been what weeks I think since we last. We saw always it. have great updates. First of all, I'm not injured. That's, so that's doing, right. Right. Remember that's right, last the kickboxing, time. That's uh, right. Gotta that's watch right. out for that. A little bloody the last time, so <laughs> getting better, slightly better. Or I'm hurting in other places we can't see. <laughs> we don't want to go there. Right. That's right. <laughs> uh, no. So I'd say uh, we're tremendously excited. It's been rapid adoption of the Rapid Miner Seven release. Um, it's a release that has a lot of meaning in the Spark community. We now have capability to execute or to push down something like a thousand data prep methods and 250 machine learning libraries into the machine learning models into Spark. Um, so there's some great stuff on the product side. I think uh, Gartner has just released the magic quadrant for advanced analytics, predictive analytics platforms. We're really one of three key commercial offerings that are in the leaders quadrant and we've moved very sharply in advance of our legacy incumbent competition. So some great stuff since then, Thank, thanks for asking. Yeah, congratulations. So let's jump in a little bit, because we're here at Spark now, we're not yeah. at, uh, at Wisdom, so talked a little bit about it, but where is really the key tie between RapidMiner and Spark, and how do you see Spark kind of changing the game for RapidMiner? Yeah, Miner? a couple key messages. I'd say thematically, we couldn't be more excited about Spark. Spark is something like a hundred times performance improvement over alternative approaches. So that's tremendously exciting if you're a data scientist, citizen data scientist, if you're a business owner trying to do really perform compute intensive machine learning modeling and predictive analytics modeling. So that's, that's just tremendous. I'd say a second key area for us well beyond the performance, and of course we take advantage, and I'm sure we'll get into some discussion of what we take advantage of in terms of support, but Rapid Miner really expands the universe of people that can take advantage of this just transformational paradigm shift in technology. Spark today is still, as I'm sure we can see here at this summit, a very developer-centric <laughs> effort. Yes. You know, it's kind of, you know, um, a bit a bit lower down in the weeds still, certainly relative to where, where um, a lot of the customer conversations I'm having take place. Lines Rapid of code in the keynotes, that's really all you need to know. Right, right, <laughs> a bit deeper than where I am, for sure. Um, so, if you think about that lines of code in the keynote, RapidMiner is a code optional platform. So, for deep coders, we have native support of R and Python scripts, which we can execute in Spark. So, Spark R, PySpark, that's fantastic. If you are not really developer-centric, you can still use RapidMiner to help exploit all of the capabilities of Spark, but through a visual interface. So you're much more expanding from data scientists to really the citizen data scientists that um, really do want to take advantage of all that Spark has to offer. So, so let me let me try and unpack a couple of those things because they're very they're very significant. So R traditionally has been uh, very popular or open source statistical programming language, but for the most part, as far as I understand, like only really Teradata and maybe Oracle sort of on their own um, made it distributed. Um, so Spark R, I assume, is uh, an implementation that al allows you to program in R as if you were on a single machine and it works across the cluster, That's scales, right. scales out. That's right. That's right. Okay. So we have direct integration. We announced in fall last year that we would support developers who are able to take advantage of their code of that distributed computing framework in Spark. And so that type of effort is 
pioneering. We're the first predictive analytics platform to do so. And I think kind of even if I go beyond that, and I think about it as a journey, we've been supporting native execution in Hadoop since 2011. So Spark to us is really a very natural evolution of a much broader migration adoption towards that Hadoop big data centric you know, um, approaches, modern approaches to predictive analytics problems. Now, just to, to clarify, um, if you can parallel, parallelize R, if that's a verb, um, does that, do all the libraries inherit that capability? Is that, yeah, we, is that what make them, makes them all elastic? We have support today for two of the libraries that are affiliated with, with, Spark, with the Spark platforms. The Machine Learning Lib, MLLib, yeah, yeah, yeah. and as well as H2O. So with RapidMiner, you can take advantage of all of those cool offerings that are developed there, and we expect to be able to announce shortly some of um, some more special capabilities, in particular with the H2O library. And so you could use R within Spark to talk to MLLib or H2O, and those libraries are distributed. Yeah, and I don't want to get, okay. and I, I think I, I know George, we're, we're, yeah, I, don't, I kind okay. of, don't want to get too deep right, you right. know, and, and stray out of it. I'd say kind of the higher level message is in terms of less how we make the pasta, but more the delicious tasting meal afterwards is I think, uh, you know, you could think of Rapid Miner, I think, as a platform that easily enables both coders who want to get really under the cover in the weeds, and I'm not the right person, my founder, my partner and, 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 and technical founder, Ingo, would really be able to do justice. Okay. That's why okay. I don't want to, to stray into areas where he's better served than me. I'm but I say that the, the coders level, I think there's tremendous optionality to really take advantage of everything Spark has at multiple levels. Okay. I think the other part, which is really exciting for the Spark platform itself, is there's a whole universe of people who really understand that Spark represents a paradigm shift in the big data era. You know, a hundred times performance improvement, let's say, relative to alternative approaches. And then, how do you open up and make that much more accessible to a broader universe of analysts that are really, you know, when you look at the click tech and the tableau wave of data visualization and self-service analytics that are really moving beyond, I think, explanation of what's happened in the past and wanting to embrace new capabilities to really plot complex associations and make predictive insights and take action into what will happen. So I'd say we're a platform that can govern, even for the coders, the seamless integration and orchestration across the full life cycle of predictive analytics. Data prep, modeling and validation, and ultimately operationalization where right. you deploy. And, and as you said, the citizen data scientist, right, which is really where everybody wants to go to open Growing this five up. times faster, Jeff. We talked about it right, a few weeks right. ago. Growing five times faster than the data scientist. Well, and ultimately population. should just be citizen, right? I mean, ultimately, you don't want it to have to be a data scientist to have, to have the opportunity to execute better decisions based on a data-driven right. uh, process. That's right, I think that's right. I think it's still, even with today and data visualization and analytics, I think we do have that aspiration to push more deeply into the citizen, as you say, uh, let's call it the Microsoft Excel user, the three to 400 million people that can use Excel. But I think a word of caution is we still want our analytics processes, whether they're visual analytics today, or I'm going to say predictive analytics, a little bit more complicated, to happen within a governed framework. I don't think we want to have a situation where someone happens to come at a particular insight on their own in one corner of the organization and then take action when someone else may have a very different view. So I think analytics, predictive analytics, all of that has, still has to take place within a some kind of a governed framework yeah, so absolutely. that decisions aren't just precariously arrived at. I think with predictive analytics you have another challenge which is that you still need um, a degree of, let's call it safety rails, so that we make sure that we're drawing the right, we're making sure that we're, we're validating the right type of predictive what are, insights. What are those safety rails? Because we keep hearing from different vendors that, you know, 
IT has to give guardrails if, if they're giving sort of yeah. power of self-service you know, in different domains. Yeah. What, what, what are those? Yeah, so I think, I don't think IT has to give the guardrails in our use case, I can't speak to other vendors, but I would say that um, the type of guardrails that, uh, that we believe we support in this massive movement, I think Jeff talked about citizen, I call it massive movement towards data democratization, data visualization, engagement, really the analytics revolution in this big data era. I'd say what we uh, think about to the end user in our use case is really guided, uh, both self-service and guided workflows. So when you, thought, when you think about that predictive analytics life cycle, data prep, model and validate, and then ultimately you operationalize, yeah. we help you within the platform with uh, automated recommendations for data prep, model selection, Got it. and parameter options. If you think about the world of big data and Spark, let's take it back to Spark, 250 machine learning algorithms. We have 95% of the world's known machine le learning algorithms built in. Okay. But any particular algorithm may or may not be useful against any particular data set. It's bewildering. How do you choose? So I think helping our data scientists and citizen data scientists really begin to get more quickly to which one of these is most likely to be of best benefit is a real help. Even within a particular algorithm, you can have a dozen or so parameters that require tuning. So I think some form of guided workflow in that regard can really jumpstart. Like a and wizard. I think, yes, that's right. Or we call it wisdom of the crowds. Okay. And I think being the number one open source predictive analytics platform, there's something like a quarter million active users of RapidMiner who have had tremendous experience in applying these machine learning algorithms against different data sets and can really aid and accelerate that life cycle. So let's talk about some of the problems they're solving, some of the applications they're building. Yeah. Um, is, is there a, a customer journey in terms of how much of the application surface area they get comfortable with at first? Is there commonality in terms of the first applications they start yeah. building? Yeah, what, what a great question. We actually had a chance um, following our, our wisdom conference to actually look back on the year. Um, and we actually did a, a little bit of a deep dive into the use cases that propelled us in our growth. We doubled the year over year, so we thank Jeff and his team for coming out and talking to us about that. So as I think about the actual experience that we've seen and of course our plans for the future, a couple of key use cases do emerge. First of all, I'd say, um, George, that they fall into three simple, high value ROI kind of distillations. First and foremost, by a long shot, revenue-based ROI, so customer and marketing analytics. You know, cross-sell, upsell, customer segmentation, really the know your customer journey. I'd say that's by far and away the, the most important. Is this being built on a, on a customer three, a custom customer 360 data lake kind of implementation? Yeah, or? we see tremendous, of course, we're in the big data era. I wouldn't say it's restricted to that but absolutely modern data science approaches in the know your customer use case, people are really trying to move the needle to get a much better, a much more granular view of the persona, and then what can I predict about this persona, and then I'd say much more importantly, just because you can make a prediction doesn't mean you can take advantage of it. So insight without action has no value, and that's something we talked about earlier. So I would say, if you if to answer your question on use cases and how we tie RapidMiner and Spark to those use cases, if you think about the vast trove of customer data in multiple industries, financial services, telco, manufacturing, go down the list, you now are, we've now arrived at a point in time where using, say, Hadoop or other big data technologies, we're storing much more information to really round out the true persona. Customer profiling, propensity to acquire certain uh, intent, customer intent, the customer journey, what they bought and didn't buy. 
So, so much more who they, whom they hang out with in social networks. So I just say kind of higher level, we see RapidMiner, number one use case, is really taking advantage of technologies like Spark to really move the needle and get much more granular on customer insight. And then to take that customer insight, and you asked about applications, and actually embed predictive insights into either human decisions or automated actions. And so those are really cool trends. Human decisions is, we would say, something like Tableau or ClickTech, say. You might take a predictive insight, deploy it into a visual interface, and then really have a human say, wow, that's pretty cool, let's do something about this. Automated actions might be something where you have enough confidence in the predictive insight that you want to quickly just make a, a mobile offer. A shopper's in the store, she has a certain persona, you have a certain inventory, hey, let's send something out immediately and let her know that this is available at such and such a discount or so forth. So I think there's a variety of use cases, but predictive analytics, um, last year, customer and revenue ROI, number one. Number two and three, kind of tied, would be either risk-based ROI or operational efficiency. You know, kind of in a dead heat, let's call it. Operational efficiency, things like predictive maintenance, things like, um, you know, uh, operation scheduling, you know, optimization scenarios around assets, people, activities. And are these being embedded in existing enterprise apps or are they being stitched together in new workflows? Yeah, great question, both. Okay. We would say, first and foremost, the number one use case is deploying to human action, human decisions. So, most likely a visualization capability. Secondly, we would say embedding into enterprise applications. And Can so this, those could be third party or homegrown applications. Right. The, the next piece would be some form of embedding in you know, workflows, as you've pointed out. Can you elaborate when, when it's embedded in a visualization? Is it, is it sort of uh, you know, a, a GUI, um, I don't know, dashboard or, or, or just a, a, you know, from a business objects? Uh, yeah, so we announced that Wisdom, I'll use the Tableau announcement as, yeah. a, as a great uh, example of that. It was, in fact, the number one most talked about uh, development just a few weeks ago when we were with the Cube. But we are a predictive analytics platform. We're not a data visualization platform. So we really take our predictive insights and we can take advantage of, in this case, Tableau, by being able to seamlessly integrate our capabilities in their visual platform and then allow their end users to be able to get all kinds of filtering and interaction or engagement, visual engagement with those predictive insights. So I'd say in that case of embedding, you're really looking at kind of a interactive, a two-way interaction. It's not just a static display of results, but Tableau, of course, as we know, is a leader in data visualization and interaction, exploratory data discovery. Right, right. So as they kind of probe that predictive insight, there's a two-way reciprocal um, way in which their visual interface can then affect the predictive insight and vice versa. So I okay. think that's something that we're very excited about. We had a customer speak about it at our, a couple weeks ago and there's much more lined up. I think moving to other types of use cases, you know, if you're talking about, let's use risk and compliance in financial services, and you thought about the vast trove of e-surveillance that has to happen in our financial services um, customers. You're talking about a volume of communication where it's very important for insider trading or other type of compliance rules to really sort out potentially um, harmful right. conversations. And so when you think about the rate of false positives in that regard, that's really not something where the use case is going to really help you very much to deploy all that into a visual, let's call it, human decision interface. You're more likely than not to begin triaging and really using our, our predictive analytics platform to isolate the most likely troubling 
cases and really triage that and really automate, let's call it, the investigative case management work that would need to happen. In that case, we would see our platform being used to actually take advantage of a predictive insight and then immediately embed or route that predictive insight into other third party or homegrown tools. You know, there are leaders in this space like Nice Systems that do a lot of anti-money laundering or anti or you know right, financial right. crimes. So you know, third party systems or homegrown systems. We see both of them. Absolutely. Exciting. But those are those are different levels of volume and, right. and throughput. Well, Peter, unfortunately we are out of time, but we are glad that uh, you're able to stop Great. by here in our uh, trips to New York City. We seem to come to New York City a lot, George. So uh, again, thanks for uh, taking Jeff. a few Good minutes out you. of your busy day. Peter Lee from Rapid Binder. I'm Jeff Frick with George Gilbert. You're watching theCUBE. We are live in Midtown Manhattan at Spark Summit East. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break.